Uh, right. Okay, boom. All right, we're recording and we're live. All right. <laughs> we were like 15 minutes in before we remembered to hit record. <laughs> Getting better. Um, thank you for our folks who have joined us on Zoom and folks who are joining us on Facebook. So again, we, we decided to call this series Mediators and and today we're doing Mediators and Humility. And this is based off a conversation that um, Erica and um, our colleague, uh, Takesha Martinez, had, uh, what was it, about a week and a half ago, Erica? It's all one big day now, I assume. So. <laughs> I feel like that's how long ago it was, but it could have been like three weeks ago, for real. I, well, yesterday. But I think it was about like a week and some days. Yeah. All right. So um, for folks who joined us last week, you know, one of my struggles was looking directly into the camera. So everybody had the sensation of looking right at you. So that's what I'm, uh, that's, that's what I'm going to be working on today. I put a little sticky over the light that shines on the, from the camera. So I'm going to get that piercing light through my eye experience. And, um, you know, look forward to your feedback about it. For, for folks who have not seen our last talk, it is... It is on um, our YouTube channel, which is CM, CM Mediation, I'm sorry, CM Mediation, and you are welcome to, um, you're welcome to, uh, to join it. I'm sorry, I paused because I think my, my big sister joined this call, but um, she'll let oh, me know. Oh, is that who that is? I think that's who that is. Yeah, you know, I'm so, I'm so like adverse to social media that I think, People in my family are like, you're on what? You're on Facebook? You're on <laughs> I must witness this. <laughs> I must witness. <laughs> um, all right, so let's get into it. So do we want to start at like where we start, where I, where, I don't remember where it started, but I remember what I said. And then you recently had an addition that you sent me in a text. Right. Do you want right. to start yes. at the be before that text? Because I feel like there's an evolution. Yeah, there's a, so, so the background is one of the things that I say frequently that I've been seeing most recently um, in my trainings is that I want mediators to, to mediate from a place of great humility, that we are coming in, in service and not in a demeaning way, not in a humiliating way, but with humility um, to emphasize that we, you know, partly as a tool for protecting our neutrality, but also to address a lot of the stigma that people have with receiving services. So um, receiving services can be experienced as um, a humiliating experience for a lot of people. And so, and, and people have judgment about themselves at being in conflict and seeking support and getting um, help for their conflict. And so, um, I, you know, as part of my effort to, to address that, I've been being very diligent with, with training participants about um, me, providing this service, providing mediation service with great humility. And then um, in our conversation, uh, I, I can't remember the next step. You're the, you're the stenographer. So then I was like, I don't like humility. <laughs> right, right. Basically. That is what happened. I'm glad you said that. <laughs> so in my own just journey in life and mediation work and in life in general, I recognize, so from a mediator's perspective, a lot of times what happens is mediators who are really good, who like follow process and walk in integrity, and just, you know, are trying to make sure they're doing it right, honoring their neutrality and people's self-determination and all of that good stuff. They're doing it really well and they are often like not understanding the power of 
how good they are as a mediator. Like they are mm. uh, self-demeaning and they don't take plus, you give them pluses about things they did well. And they're like, oh, who me? Actually, I think I suck. And you know, <laughs> and it's just like, the, and then meanwhile, the mediators who actually do suck, they're like, well, sweetie, I was mediator of the year for five years running and I'm great. And I've been mediating for 75 years and you know, and so, like, it's it's really fl- it's, it's really flipped, and I think that is a huge part of. Do be like that. Uh, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> be like that. And so, um, so the mediators who should really celebrate themselves often don't, and I and a lot of it, and and I think so in the mediation world and also in society we are often told to be humble and that like humility is this thing that lets people know that you don't think you're better than them, right? And so there is this balance of like, how do I honor my greatness and my power and that not be a thing that I'm attacking other people with or belittling other people with because their greatness and their power also matters. And so we get socialized in this way that our this idea that you're supposed to be humble instead of still honoring your greatness it makes people cower in their own light instead of standing in their own light and so because i care a lot about like what words actually mean one day i was having my own struggle about this humility thing and so i looked up the word humble and the words humble and humility and it had a lot to do with discounting um, or downplaying your own worth and your own um, importance. And so, um, so it made me go, oh, I need to find another word. I don't like humility because that is often how people use it is that like your importance shouldn't be important. And I think it's because people do struggle with not being arrogant or not acting like they're better than other people. And so humility is the way to go. Um, So I was looking for a different word. So in that conversation with Takesha and Tracy, that was my reaction about like F humility because people use it to make us not stand in our own power and in our own brilliance when we should be. And so like, I thought maybe grace is a better word that when we are moving in grace, I am not cowering. I'm not hiding my light. I'm not diminishing my own importance. And I'm not trying to make anybody feel like they are less than me or anybody else because grace keeps me in a place of beauty and in a place of honoring everybody's light. Um, And so I felt like I had like dropped the mic on it in the conversation. And did. And then like a few days later, Tracy won't come with a text message that made me be like, oh, well, maybe we can still say humility. So Tracy. Okay. So here, here's the message. I, Cause I, I looked up uh, humility because there was something about it that I felt like was important to keep in the conversation. And so, you know, I followed Erica's example and looked up the word humility. In the so she basically way. used my own strategy to, I did, I did. To to (laughs) then defy everything I said. Well, I think it's an I think it's (laughs) like like that's the thing about us is that's the thing about us as mediators is that we have to be very uh about the the subtleties, the nuances in the language and how people can hear them. And so not enough for us like when we're doing reflections we can say a feeling and say a value that we we feel confidently nails it for the participants but their experience with the word can be very different than ours right so we have to we have to adjust we have to pivot and be ready with a new word so like now i have in my pocket as a mediator both humility and grace um yeah. and as a trainer i have that right right um, so I looked up humility and, um, it also, another definition is free from pride or arrogance. And I was saying this, this would be freedom from pride kind of humility, this pride and disdainful behavior. I want us as a community to free ourselves from the arrogance and disdain 
that blinds our judgments and separates us from from each other that's really good yeah um, and then i was like oh damn it that's really good i might <laughs> have to use humility again now and i and i think you know some of the ways that that shows up for us in our community is when i see mediators reluctant to use mediation in their own lives um right yeah. I once had a mediator whose uh, anonymity I will maintain, but their words I'll use, um, say, because I'm a mediator who uses mediator in my mediation in my life. I, I probably I think have. You start conflicts so <laughs> that you can take people to mediation. That's what I, I think. Promise, I promise I don't. I promise I don't. <laughs> but um, um so I use mediation in my own life and I was, you know, and I frequently talk about my experience as using mediation in my life as part of my training. And um, so one of the people in my training was like, so why are you, you know, why you have all these conflicts? Why you have to use mediation? You know, I, I'm just with a lot of judgment, a lot of weight. And, and I, I was just like, why wouldn't you, you know? Right. And, and this person perceived themselves as not having conflict. Um, in their life and yeah. when I tapped into it the mediator exposed they just eliminate people from their life you know they just stop wow. having relationships and so it's like it's not that you don't have a conflict is that you're cutting off yourself from relationships and that to me is yeah. um, an arrogant move that's an arrogant move and this this whole movement is about making relationships stronger so that we can make the community stronger Mm -hmm. and um so so that 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 was a big part of this conversation about humility for us and i think that um some of the ways that we step out of humility as mediators is when we decide that we um you know when we decide what's important for people you know when we decide what their values should be yeah. like well, a common one that comes up, I think, for a lot of media is fairness. Well, that's not fair. That's not fair. And it's yeah. like, by whose definition? By whose standards? Right. And and while fairness may be a, a value of theirs, they may prioritize it differently. Right. And they might pri they may prioritize winning over being fair. Like that, I am right. Whether right. you think it's fair or not. And that might be what they, that's what was most important to them. And, right. and if we're honoring their self-determination, they get to say, because I don't, it, even if I listen to somebody and I think that, well, they just want their rightness to be the most important thing. I don't know everything that they've gone through up until this point and everything they're going to go through after this mediation is over right. that informs their perception and their decision that they have to get the other person to see that they're wrong. You know, like that they're, they're like, I'm right and we you should we gotta function in my rightness. Like I don't know why they're doing that. And so I shouldn't be trying to tell them that they're wrong. For all I know, they may have very valid reasons for why being right is more important than being fair in this situation or somebody's perception of fair. And so it's better for us to just stay present with people and working on understanding what they're saying, what they are saying, instead of us trying to find slick ways to guide them toward what we think they should be saying. Right, right. Yeah, yeah, avoid the slickness. Um, I think um, I was thinking that we would we would start doing questions at twelve thirty, but um, uh, David has added a question. Hi, David. Mm -hmm. um, Michelle um, and Emily have joined us as well. Um, so I want to I want to check in on this question. How do you act to working with mediators who seem to be too prideful about their mediation skills? And also, hi. <laughs> um, um, yeah, I think, I, I, have, I have a long answer for that, so I'm, I'm going to, I'm trying to edit it as I go. So first and foremost, um, we want to center the needs of the participants at the table, right? And so if it's like, you know, just a person who's arrogant and they have, um, and, they, and their mediation skills are in line and, and are in service to the people, 
um, and they just kind of an arrogant jerk, you know, we, we, we just going to eat that and we process that with them at, at during feedback, you know, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, if they are prideful and arrogant and their, their skills are not in line with mediation and values of mediation, and we have to prioritize the participants and as respectfully as we can, you know, honestly and respectful is, is our strategy we have to deal with that. So there's some certain things like I can, I can shift the process, you know, what they're doing and I can kind of um, make up for it and, and recenter the participants in it. You know, if they did a, a positional reflection or reflection that was off or they keep asking a series of closed ended questions, I can get in and redirect that energy. Right, right. There are times where I have to get in and say, actually, I'm, I'm worried because I feel like our, our neutrality is being compromised with that question, or I feel like we're going in a direction that may be compromising our neutrality. And Tracy I, you, is gangster with hers. <laughs> See, she got that Southern thing where she can say that, and you know, I think she just snatched my edges. But I feel good about it some kind of way. It was so gentle and sweet. With my Baltimore ass, I can't say that. I got to ask a different, I ask it, but that's a very good strategy, Joe. I like that. But I, in a minute, I'll say what I, yeah. I, so, so I use our, like we, you know, like, you know, I'm, I'm talking about us as a unit. So I'm worried about this particular thing that, that question, I feel like, um, I think that'd be a great question for us to ask a little later in the process or, or what have you, right. but I'm, uh, so I'm not I'm not distancing myself from my co-mediator. Yeah, that's, that's um, what I, what I, it doesn't happen to me often because I think mm -hmm. that when people co-mediate with us, sometimes they are like trying to be on their best game and their best behavior. <laughs> and so, but and sometimes it absolutely happens where people they do something that like it's not just a delta. It makes my chest gets tight where I'm like, oh no, we're not supposed to say that. Like. And right, so, right, right. and I can't jump in there soon enough to do a different reflection or ask a different question. Um, Cause it's really a, like, it landed at the table and is about to get a reaction. And so I'll jump in and I'll ask my co-mediator a question sometimes. So I'll say, okay, so help me understand what's your, like your goal in asking that question. What are you, what's, what, 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 what strategy are you going with right now? But, mm -hmm. And then we just have a whole conversation at the table about mediator strategy in front of the participants. Now, they don't really understand, they know, like, they understand the words we're saying, but they don't really understand what we're talking about because they haven't been through mediation training. But they right. know we're, we're working something, some technical issue out in our work. Right. And so asking the co-mediator. And co doing it collaboratively. And we're doing it collaboratively, right? So asking the person, okay, so t help me understand that question. What's, what's your goal with this question? Or talk to me about the strategy you're using right now. What are you hoping? Because I'm thinking maybe there's a different way we could get that same, you know, thing. And so when, when I ask that, it makes the person think about it. And then they realize almost immediately like oh well, i was trying to get him to see that she was right and then boom we got it and then i can say oh okay so i think we want to you know stay away from you know getting that one to see the other and i think your instinct is right that and so i'll reflect it sounds like you were saying you felt devastated when blah 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 right and so maybe there's a different question we can ask or something else we can do to get at what that's about for, right? And so we talk about it and get a new strategy right there in front of them. And maybe we let that thing go because my co was like, oh, yeah, I wasn't supposed to be saying that. I shouldn't be asking that. My intention was something I shouldn't even have. And so they go like, you know what? Never mind. You're right. Let's not even. And then we go, okay, thanks. And then we move on to something else. And so ultimately, whether we come out with a different strategy or we let that thing go altogether, what participants get to see is we modeled a disagreement happened and it wasn't nasty. Right. right. It wasn't, right. Right. there was a, I, they, my code did something that I questioned. I checked in about it. So they get to see us 
have uh it might be an awkward conversation mm -hmm. um but it wasn't a nasty conversation and we had a disagreement and everything turned out fine and we just got back to the process but also they see us delivering what they were told they were going to get so in intake they were told mediators aren't going to judge you they're not going to take sides they're not going to give advice hey. so when we are checking each other in real time to have conversations about the strategies that we're using participants get to see they're like oh that person must have been about to do something and they're trying to make sure they don't do the stuff that they told us weren't wasn't going to happen um, but also it makes one of my favorite things about participants and the impact that mediators can have is that participants can leave the table realizing that they could be a mediator too right so like if a mediator is this thing that never messes up never makes a mistake it's completely perfect and robotic and they're doing some jedi magic that nobody else understands participants leave the table like oh i don't know what they were doing i can't do that but if they see at the table people who were like wait a minute i have a question about that or are you ready to move to the next step no girl, i'm not ready i got a few more questions oh that's not what i want to say don't answer that question right if they see us being humans at the table while we're trying to run the process then they go oh well that's something i can learn how to do if there's room for me to make mistakes while i'm doing it and somebody will have my back even in the midst of me making a mistake and we're going to correct it together and it's going to be fine that's something i can learn how to do i can be a mediator too so that it's not just this thing that mediation is for those other people but as a mediator you know as a participant i can be a mediator and as a mediator i can also be a participant right 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 um i think um i think the other reason i wanted to have this conversation i mentioned um at our last on our last uh chat with each other that oh well, I'm sorry. Go ahead. David's question was also about like how to deal with the person. So we gave at the table strategies. Mm. And I think the other piece is what happens in feedback. Yeah. Right. Yes, yes. And so I think most often where mediator arrogance shows up is when you're giving someone a delta about something that they think was a great and perfect strategy. And I know you learned in training that you're not supposed to do that, but out here in the real world, like I do this and it works type shit. And so like, so I will give a mediator a delta about the way they receive deltas. <laughs> okay, so it sounds like you feel proud about your experience as a mediator and the strategies that you use and confident that what you do, what you, you know, this particular strategy works. Something else to maybe think about is how you perceive and receive Delta, because I mean it as the gift when I'm saying to you, you know, that here's what we teach in training, here's what we learn in training. And when you say something works, that's not the same thing as it fell in line with our role as a mediator a lot of things might quote mm -hmm. unquote work that's not what we're supposed to do and there are other things mm -hmm. that would also work but are in line with our role as a mediator and so when i'm giving you this gift of providing that that insight or that perspective about that strategy and you say oh well you know this is because of your your experience and your wisdom maybe if you looked at deltas as oh this is an opportunity for growth this is something your co is saying to you because they care about you as a mediator um, and the quality of service you're providing maybe you wouldn't be as resistant to hearing things that are different from strategies you're used to using and if this is a strategy you use then maybe here are some end services you might want to attend because there are other ways to do what you're trying to do and still stay in line with your role as a mediator. Because what you're doing now is some bullshit. So. <laughs> <laughs> what she said, what she said. Yeah, these mediators don't, don't skip the feedback section. You know, like, again, that's, 
that is not in line with humility. That's not in line with our role as a mediator. How we grow the movement, how we grow our skills as individuals, and how we grow this movement is is growing ourselves, right? And that back is an important part of it. And when you know, and and for mediators who are uncomfortable giving deltas, and we we say deltas, we say pluses and deltas, not pluses and negatives. Um, mediators uncomfortable getting deltas, uh, lead with that then. Um, so when you are preparing for the mediation, you, you need to ask your co-mediator, okay, what are the things that you are working on? What are the things that you want me to be paying attention to, to give you feedback on, right? So that's a way to help you kind of figure out where to, where to, where to go with your deltas. Because yeah. my biggest mediator pet peeves is when uh, I'm I'm doing feedback with my co media and I'm like I really didn't see anything wrong, you know. And I don't know why that's the face of I didn't see anything wrong. It is, it is though. <laughs> the voice, the octave goes up, right. and it's like, um, yeah, look, I'm 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 pretty solid and sure of my my capacity as the mediator, and I also I'm not perfect, you know. And so I need my co-mediator to pay attention to those ways that I can grow um, and yeah. the ways others in this, in this process to grow. So, um, so, you know, put, a, pull on your, put on your big people, put on your big mediator draws and, and give both plus and deltas. We both can learn. We can yeah. learn from both. Yeah. And if not, you are just as responsible for the things they do from now on as they are. So if you didn't have the courage to give the deltas and there's things they're doing that you are actually worried about, just know that if you don't give the deltas, you have to be willing to accept that when they continue to do that stuff at other mediations, it's now also on you as well because you didn't say it. You didn't give them an opportunity to do anything differently. So there's that. Yeah. Okay, Tracy, what else were you about to say about why you wanted to have this conversation? Oh, right. <laughs> you have that look. There's this look you get on your face when you know I'm about to say something that's controversial. <laughs> I'm, so glad. I'm so glad it's Tracy saying it this time because it's usually me that's saying it. Because it's usually me. <laughs> you, when I was, just talk, you know, I was just talking normal and then I find <laughs> out, you know you're controversial. Who, me? I'm controversial. What do you mean? I'm just talking. <laughs> um, so, yeah. So, the folks who were on this, uh, on the last, on the last call know that, um, I have a, as, as strong as my reluctance to, um, be on social media is my reluctance to go to, mediation conferences of any sort so don't let any of the conferences people get upset i have a hard time with it in general and yeah. one of the things that makes it hard is um the how humility does or doesn't show up um at at the conference mm. um i do feel i feel good about i'm gonna just go ahead and mute myself now because i'm about to be making all the noises and sounds <laughs> go ahead I do feel good about we, you know, Eric and I and uh, community mediation. We we teach, we train in the inclusive mediation model, and I'm glad that there are um, there's a diversity of mediation models out there for people to choose from. Um, I I, you know, we often get asked the question, well, which one is best for which situation? And I feel like we haven't we haven't yet earned the right to to answer that question because we have not educated mediation participants enough about mediation so they have they have the capacity to be able to um, uh, assess it correctly you know and so once more people are able to use the service and know how the service is, is supposed to be delivered then we'll be able to better um, evaluate like you know where, who for whom this this service you know, this model of mediation inclusive is better for who, facilitative is better for who and what circumstances, transformative is better for who and what circumstances, right? Um, 
And, you know, I. What about evaluative, Tracy? What about evaluative? What situations? <laughs> when when can we when can we use the evaluative model? Oh. Okay. Bye. Everybody hear that sound? You heard that slam? That is the gates of heaven closing on Erica forever. <laughs> because she just, you know, she started, she started stuff. She started stuff. Um, so, um, yeah, this, 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 com, this, uh, this controversy about evaluative and, and was it the other one, an analytical mediation on whether in fact that really is yeah. a mediation because there's, there's a lot of uh, advice given in that and that kind of yeah. in the face. And, that, and that's, that's part of my problem with, you know, what, what happens when you get, um, I don't know what you call, you know, a, a group of crows is called a murder of crows. A group of dolphins is called a pod. I don't know what a group of mediators is called. I'm going to call it a mess of mediators. And, <laughs> and um, when you get a... I think that's right. I think mess <laughs> is exactly the word. Yes. You have a, a a mess of mediators, um, and you, you, you we we have not elevated our conversation yet about mediation. You know, like we're not when 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 there's a mess of us, we're still having very basic conversations about mediated mediation. So there's still workshops like, uh, can mediators give suggestions? No. Okay, next workshop. Like this, this is what I think should be happening. And I hear people, me, people calling themselves mediators, um, saying really arrogant stuff that, in fact, I feel like is insulting to people who are using mediation. And as part of the problem, why people don't want to use mediation, because they feel judged by us, right? So I, I once heard a mediator say, um, and I don't know their name, so I, you know, this was, this was at a conference. Um, we have to be smarter than everybody else in the room. It's like, one, not possible. Two, <laughs> two, that is not what we have to do. Um, and three, that is like well out of line with that humility. Like um, to assume that you could do that and that you should do that. Um, I think that it's not about, we have to be committed. We have to be the most committed to listening, right? and to separating ourselves from our judgments and our our beliefs about what's right than everybody else in the room but it's not about being the smartest right and so um i often use the example my example of that kind of humility and mediation is um is a uh, peter fox colombo right colombo from from peter fox and and he, uh, for folks who have not seen it, go on. To, Are you going to do your impersonation? Because this is one of I'm my favorite things. Y'all are in for a treat. If you have ever seen <laughs> Columbo, you did not know that Columbo was a black woman from Columbus, Georgia, but you're about to find out. Okay. Let me just, the disclaimer is it's better when it's live. So come to a training and you'll see. But like Columbo, you, you can see Columbo on YouTube and I think he's on Netflix now. But, um, you know, he was, he was a very humble character. And I don't want us to duplicate his investigative style. I want us to duplicate his humility. So, like, every time he was on the case, the criminal just knew they were getting away because they're like, this cat can't catch me, right? Because he would be like, he'd come in and like, um, I just, I, I want to make sure I understand. So why are you saying this? Is that what you say? Ah, thanks so much. Oh, 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 and another thing. You know, there's always another thing, right? <laughs> so, you know, he he wasn't like the the detectives now, the all the CSIs and the um uh what do what do we have? Uh, law and order people. Those people yeah, look they hot shots. They, they hot they're shot, right? Hot they shots. He was not closed. a hot shot. Right. You can tell their clothes came straight out of wardrobe. They were steam pressed and everything. They, these people are gorgeous. He looked like he just woke up 10 minutes before he got there. I don't care what time of day it is. He always had a five o'clock shadow. You know what I'm saying? And you're like, his wife doesn't love him because none of his clothes look like 
anybody has ever cared about him. And he's in California, and for some reason, he's always wearing a trench coat, right? <laughs> but he, um, but he was so accessible and so humble, but at, and at the same time, very confident in his skills, right? And so humility is not the absence of confidence, right? And it's not the absence of executing your skills at the highest level because he you know he he was bad you know what i'm saying there was a reason he always got called to the scene because he he knew his stuff right and i feel like we can be that kind of mediator who you know who is accessible who participants feel like i can trust with this this very personal information to support me to get through this conflict and right I can I can I can work confidently knowing the work that I have invested in my skills, right? Um, I too many times I we go through basic training and like uh, when you know our, our trainings are fifty hour trainings and you know people first hear fifty eight hours and they're like that is so many hours and it is until you start doing it and at like hour like hour twenty nine people are like. This is not enough hours. We need more time. And sometimes people will say to me, like, you know, on the third, fourth day of training, I can't do it. I'm not able to do it. It's like, yeah, that's too mm -hmm. soon. You know, like you can't, I haven't finished one, I haven't finished teaching you. <laughs> so <laughs> and two, and two, you really, if you are mediating regularly, and I mean like at least twice a twice a month, um, you need to give yourself at least two years to 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 get fluent in these skills that's facts yeah so give yourself at least two years but um yeah you know people want to come in and like get it and be you know speak speak fluent mediates and you know that's the first place that the arrogance starts that's for it. adult learners right it. if, yeah uh, well if i learn it i'm a grown-up and i'm smart so i should be able to just do it now and it should take me, you know, why do I have to spend 50 hours doing it? And then they bring in all of their life experience and they tell you about their whole resume and that how, and then generally we listen to their resume and we're like, yeah, you got to unlearn a whole lot of shit to be a mediator, given all of the experience that you've had. And so, um, and, and what's interesting to me about that is if you want to, so when I wanted to be a preschool teacher, and to just deal with two-year-olds, I had to take 90 hours <laughs> of freaking training. Like, it was a 90-hour certification that I had to do, plus all kind of practice stuff that I had to do. Plus, I had to know CPR in case somebody swallowed a penny or whatever kids do. And so it's like, you know, we when when you pay to go to community college or something, right, to get some kind of certification, you're going to do at least 75 hours of in-class learning, right? And that's just to do whatever this thing is. But for some reason, people demonize conflict on one hand, but then on the nub, see what I did there? One hand and then on the nub. But then they will demonize conflict on one hand. And then on the nub, they think you can be trained to sit in the middle of conflict and not give your opinion and you not even get slapped or cussed out. And that should take you less than 50 hours. Right. Like, right. I don't understand how, like, right. that even. And so, but it, it is, it's the first place of arrogance, like whoever I already think I am, I should mm -hmm. be able to, and like the, the, you, 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 the better mediators are, are often the ones who stay open. They stay learners right. and right. They're, they're, they're constantly learning. They're constantly growing. They are appreciative for all of the learning and growth and, and they feel disrespected when you don't give them a delta. We're not leaving right. the table until you give me a delta. Right. And I feel like you don't respect me as a mediator because you telling me, but it's you and you know how to shut up and give me a delta. Okay. I'm gonna mute myself again. <laughs> yeah. And um 
I think that it's, it's 50 hours of training plus an apprenticeship and plus keep getting to the table. Like, I feel like it, I can't imagine really being arrogant and mediating frequently because no one humbles me like participants. <laughs> like, like, I've been mediating now. Everybody hold your hats. I've been mediating for 17 years now. And I still... Um, That's amazing because you only like, like, what, 35? <laughs> right? Like, um, oh, wait, know, I'm 67. Sorry. You're 65. You're 65. <laughs> I forgot. You go up, right? Right. right. Okay. My bad. That's um, right. um, I feel like, um, maybe forget my point. So, I'm yeah. Sorry. <laughs> mediators, you get, you, I still have situations after 17 years of mediating regularly where I'm like, they need a better mediator. <laughs> like, right. like, I'm 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 a strong mediator. I'm pulling out my A game, right? Yeah. <laughs> and I don't I don't feel like enough right now, you know. Yeah. And um and so I'm they are constantly inspiring me and challenging me. You know, real life participants are constantly inspiring me and challenging me to grow my skills. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and you, it, the more you mediate, you absolutely, well, it's it, when you mediate with an open heart. Mm -hmm. right. You absolutely notice, oh, yeah, I'm a work in progress. 19 right. years later. Yeah, I'm right. Yeah, still a work in progress. Yeah. And, and, and that, that this other piece of how arrogance can show up and how humility can what could resolve the situation is when um, participants say, so at what point do you feel like they've just come to impasse and you can't, you know, you're not going to be able to help? Um, if they are at the table, if they stay at the table, <laughs> I'm going to stay at the table and support them. Right. If they're still willing to have the conversation, then with great humility, I'm going to sit in the room with all the discomfort of being in the room with people who are in um in active conflict unresolved active conflict i'm going to sit there and keep working towards understanding doing that out loud asking open-ended questions and trying to support them in moving through the process yeah but, you know because they aren't you know behaving like i think people who um who come to mediation should behave that doesn't mean you know they aren't receiving the service right. They aren't. They aren't. They aren't doing mediation correctly, right? So, you know, we have to change our minds about what it means to be in conflict and what it means to use mediation. Um, and right, and to remember that I like, the only I like this people language you use. I like this language you use, Erica, of, of doing it with an open heart. Yeah. And I think remembering that the only people who can be doing mediation wrong at the table is the mediators, not the participants. Right, <laughs> like, right, 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 right. Participants right. can't be doing mediation wrong. Like, they didn't go through the training, but also they're just, they're doing the conflict and they are doing conflict the way that they do conflict. So they can't be doing mediation wrong. Right. Um, I want to check in if there were more questions. Um, Erica, I can't. I don't have any on Facebook. Okay. All right. Cool. People are loving the mess of mediators. That's so. That's right. It's, it's official. It's a, called a mess when it's. So what? <laughs> when it's when it's when it's. So is it like four or more? Because like you got a couple is two, a few mediators is three, and then like once you hit four, then it's, it's a, a mess. mess. Of, it's a mess of mediators. It makes sense to me. Okay. I feel like that's correct. When I think about me and three other mediators. That's a mess. <laughs> I think that's right. Um, the um, the other thing I also want us to to pay attention to in terms of humility is um, there can be a way that volunteering, providing a service, um, can give you power. Can give you mm. and um we want to pay attention to that you know we want to pay attention to that 
So it's not that I'm I'm advocating for people to feel powerless, but um, and there's there's a lot of ways that people can derive power, and a lot of people that ways that people can use power, and so be careful about using that power to elevate yourself at the expense of others. Um, mm. our, our participants, you know, like Eric has already very um, eloquently stated, there's a lot of judgment about people being in conflict and using mediation to work through conflict. Um, and we do not want to exacerbate it and off future participants by not paying attention to the ways that we may be deriving power by providing uh, a service. Mm -hmm. You know, whether it's, whether you're volunteering or you're getting paid, um, that we're not coming at it as if, as if we, you know, we are elevated in this, in this relationship. Yeah. Um, and we need to, and I think one way to do that is making sure that we are we are allowing ourselves to be mediation participants if you are a mediator and you're saying you have not had a conflict in this past year that could not go to mediation i would check your humility <laughs> um i work elaine is saying elaine has a really good question and i think the, this is the second time you mentioned that uh mediators going to mediation i think that should be our next discussion Okay. Yeah. Mediators good. and using mediation themselves. Um, Cause I've learned a lot. Me by being a participant in mediation, I've learned a lot about the process itself and how mm. important certain things are. Mm -hmm. um, I know of the times where I said, actually, I wouldn't take this thing to mediation. And it made me think really deeply about what makes me decide when I do and when I don't take things to mediation. And it reminded me of the importance of honoring people's self-determination and the voluntary nature of taking something to mediation or handling it some other kind of way. Um, and so I think that's, a, that that's like a really good conversation. But yeah, that's a good question from uh, Elaine. You want to read it? Yes. So Elaine says, I worry about mediators who practice different styles and everyone thinks theirs is the only and the best way. She capitalized those words, which is why I'm putting emphasis on them. Mm -hmm. And we can be very self-defeating when we get into those kinds of camps. What mindset do we need to come to together and grow this field? Oh, what mindset do we need to come together and grow this field? So my initial um, reaction to that is, um, <clears throat> I think this is one part of the reason that there needs to be a lot of education and awareness to the larger world about what mediation actually is. The first thing we need to do as a field is to really get on the same page. We still argue about what is mediation, right? And so, Excellent. and from there, that's where we can't, you know, like there's so separate from like, if your model is good or not, like the question usually is, is what you're doing even mediation or not? And there's a lot of debate and argument about that. So that's the first thing we need to do. And what's weird to me about it is there is like in Maryland, there's a whole definition of like, this is mediation. And so I don't know if it's that the definition needs to be tightened up or you know what but people get to take that definition and then play with it and say well i'm still doing things that falls within this definition so i think when macro did the um they were trying to honor diversity of practice some years back and so they worked with mediators from all different models to come up with the, the, the different definitions of models so un until we really do get a standard, we all agree, here's what mediation is, and here are things mediators should never do. Until we get that, the definitions that we have are a really good start. 
but we need awareness and education about those to the people outside of the mediation world because then somebody could read what transformative mediation is what inclusive is i think facilitative needs to have several different definitions because in real life Facilitation, facilitative mediation practice. When Macro did, Macro is the Maryland Mediation and Conflict Resolution Office, who here in Maryland is an arm of the judiciary who funds conflict management and supports mediation and conflict management stuff all over the state. And so one of the things they did is they did this survey that had like a hundred questions on it. And it asked mediators what you do and why, basically, within this 100 question survey. And what they came out with was you could tell, like, so transformative mediators and inclusive mediators, inclusive didn't even have a name at the time, right? But it said, like, transformative mediators and people said they were who they were trained at a community mediation center they fell very much on the side of the spectrum of mediators who are saying people should speak for themselves mediators shouldn't give advice or suggestions and then there were people who fell all the way on the other spectrum who would like try to find ways to guide participants and give suggestions and stuff like that and then there were these people all in the middle of the spectrum right and what they found, so they could get very clear, oh, transformative and inclusive people are like, they're over here. But then for facilitative, they said their turn, it looked like there were 25 different models of facilitative mediation processes. And so what that means is that when you hear somebody say, hey, I'm a facilitative mediator, you're not actually sure what they might or might not do until they actually get at the table because it depends on who trained them and what kind of quality assurance and all of that stuff they are consistently participating in. And so I think even with the definitions, facilitative has a definition. And then when I personally train facilitative mediators, for instance, about how to co-mediate and give pluses and deltas to one another, in the training, those facilitative mediators will disagree with each other about what you should or shouldn't do at the table and why. And so I think there needs to be, um, so we need to get clearer about the different kinds of facilitative things, um, but also take the definitions that we have and really educate the public about them so that consumers of mediation can say, based on the situation that I'm in, when I read these definitions, here's the one I want to use to run my conflict. Here's the process I want to use. And that way, media, we don't have to be saying what's the best one. Sometimes court is my best option. Sometimes mediation is my best option. Sometimes conflict coaching is my best option. Sometimes calling you up and cussing you out is my best option because that's the kind of friendship we have and that's where we need to start if we're really going to heal something you know like so it, it depends but people should get to decide for themselves and it should be that mediators just make i think elaine mediators should within themselves really make a decision that we're not going to say what process is best we should say here are our ethical standards and my ethics as a me you know and mediators are either ethical or unethical regardless of what process you use there are some things that are mediator ethics and so if we all get clear about what the ethics are which we have ethical standards and we all operate within those ethics then consumers just get to decide which process they feel most comfortable running their conflict through and that, you know, and that that would be that. And so I do think that mediation is one of the, um, I, I guess every field is full of ego. Um, and I'm, I'm often surprised, even 19 years in, I'm often surprised because in the, the I guess, because we do kind of grassroots work, it's shocking to me that mediators are some of the most arrogant, egotistical people that I will meet when they're talking about conflict management. <laughs> I'll just be like, that's not inclusive. That's not collaborative. That's not transparent. That's not, you know, like all of these things that I think we have the same values around, then I, you know, sometimes people don't. And so um, I think that also feeds the, like some one, one my, was the best or better I think is really around people disagreeing around ethically 
A, what mediation is and isn't, and then ethically the strategies that mediators use at the table. Because I do, I'm going to be honest, I think it's dangerous to just make an umbrella and be like, oh, if you call yourself mediation, if it's mediation, everybody need to be quiet about what I'm doing and just let me mediate and don't say that what I'm doing is wrong. I think that's dangerous. I think we absolutely should be able to say to one another, what you're doing is unethical and is not the role of a mediator, regardless of what model. I think we should be able to say that to one another. Um, and it shouldn't just be like, well, let's all just get along. And, and, the, and the practice is right. practice. And, and, and when, we, when, we, when we allow ourselves to be flexible with it, then participants get confused about what mediation is and they're unable to advocate for themselves. They're right. unable to say that this was not what I signed up for. Right. Uh, and so that, you know, that's why you find uh, Erica and, and, and I and, and the rest of the CMM staff really hardcore about staying within the confines that we teach because we're trying to educate consumers about what it is so that they can hold us accountable. Right. And say, that's not what you told us you were going to be doing. Exactly. And as trainers, we have learned, Elaine, I just want to add this part too. We have learned through going to all of the conferences that Tracy does not like going to, that we don't say, oh, that's wrong in another model we go oh that's one way to do it and in the inclusive model here's how he how we would handle it right because that that honors just that whether i think that's the right way to do it or not we are less likely to say in a public space to people oh no that thing that you know that strategy that that mediator just now said they would use that's wrong we go okay that's one way to do it. And in the inclusive model, here's what, here's what we would do. And that way, because the, the debate about whether it's ethical or not, is something, those are personal arguments mediators are having all the time, right? And then, but in, in an education and awareness kind of space, um, it's really more important to just say, well, in the model that I use, here are the things I would always do. Here are the things I would never do. Here are the things I might sometimes do. Um, awesome. I'm glad, I'm glad you, you brought that up. I am, um, I'm adding to the chat, um, a link for our last, um, our last, um, conversation. Thanks for uploading that, um, Erica. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, I'm sorry. Can you talk and stall while I, cause I just remembered to do this. Okay. Um, so there's somebody on Facebook who said she met a lady at Southwest Partnership board meeting last Tuesday, and she didn't know this program existed. Very good. Oh, she, she found Community Mediation Maryland by attending a, a meeting in Baltimore last week. <laughs> so, yay! Oh. That's nice. Awesome, and awesome, so awesome. She started following our pages, so she's seeing that we're doing this live discussion today. So thank you, Dorothy. That's nice. That is nice. So mm -hmm. I'm almost there. I'm almost there. Sorry. What is it that you're doing? I'm putting the link from from uh, last week's um, conversation in the chat. Oh, okay. Um, and I shared that with everybody. We also, if you go to our YouTube channel, it is um, CM Mediation, and um, we have uh, several demos, two, two demos actually. Um, one is, um, one is um, uh, the latest one demo that we did is us, uh, Erica, Lorg, Charcutian, our executive director, and another trainer, Caroline Harmondero, doing a demo on Zoom, so us mediating online. And then we also have another demo, which is, um, a typical mediation, uh, before times mediation, <laughs> pre pre quarantine mediation, um, and uh, lots of lots of direction and instruction on that one. So I encourage people. the YouTube channel is CM Mediation. Is that what you said? Yep. Okay. Yep. I'll put that in there. I was putting it on the, in the Facebook comments. Okay. Yay. 
um, so um, two two of those, and then there's a there's a shorter demo that that features Erica's son Paul, who is also a really good mediator. Um, he and I are co-mediating together. It's a really short one, but um, uh, it's talking about parenting plan mediation. But there are a few clips, and we will be um, uploading these conversations onto YouTube. So if you wanna, if you didn't catch the whole thing, you can look on it there. And if there are things that you want us to talk about, please let us know. Um, yes. All my people have my um, contact information. Uh, I'll put it in the chat. Um, Lord. I just, I'm, I, I don't do um, social media that much because I, I answer my phone. And I think that um, the law is if you Did answer- y'all hear that shade? <laughs> That was Shay. Did y'all catch it real quick when she said, because I answer my phone? <laughs> if you answer your phone, you don't have to get on social media, right? <laughs> that's not true. I think that's how that works. That's not true. It's a no, local ordinance. It's a Baltimore ordinance. <laughs> and if it's, it's, if it's not, the next mayor will make it one. Tanya, Tanya caught it. That's all that matters. <laughs> Thank you, Tanya. Cause she being real petty right now, but it's okay. <laughs> All right, good people. I think I think we're done. We we run a little bit yes. over. We run over time. Thank you so much for um for joining us and your questions and your good comments. Yeah. Um, your uh, shady comments to take um Erica's side, Tanya. <laughs> <laughs> um. Uh, <laughs> Thank you so much, and um, thank we'll, you. Well, um, please look out for um, please look out for the um for the next one. Talk to you soon. Yeah, yeah. Have a good one. Oh, 